So um, we want to start, first of all, because we know that you're, um, you're all volunteers by outlining what we're going to be dealing with. So I'll deal with the welcome and introductions. My name is Sarah Williams-Martin, um, and I'm technically a railroaded 3SG. And we've got Miles, who is the coordinator of 3SG here. So Miles, do you want to tell everyone what 3SG is, just in case people don't know on this call? <laughs> yeah, no, that's totally understandable. I don't think my parents know what 3SG is yet. Um, so it, it stands for Bath and North East Somerset Third Sector Group. And the third sector is basically social enterprises, charities, community groups. So really, that's at the heart of what 3SG does. And then we also do all of this COVID response with volunteers. So we're very lucky over the last year to sort of go in a different direction and be doing this as well as our normal sort of day-to-day -day supporting charities. So yeah, we're a very small organisation and with two employees and then Sarah very luckily has come on board over the last year. So thank you, Sarah. No problem. So um, then we're going to be dealing with um, so data and roadmap and that's going to be dealt with uh, by Cathy from Public Health. So welcome, Cathy. Uh, give us a wave. Here we are. <laughs> and she's also going to be dealing with the COVID testing situation as well. And then we've got um, the vaccinations going to be dealt with by Anna. So, um, Anna, do you want to give us a wave? Hi, everyone. <laughs> Thank you. And then I'm going to pick back up on the plans for the volunteers. And then we're going to do the Q&A right at the end. So, as I said, pop your questions into the chat box and we'll deal with them right at the very end. So, um, so I'm going to start um, by handing over to Public Health, and um, it's over to you, Cathy. Great, thank you. Um, lovely to see everyone. Great turnout this evening. Thanks ever so much. Um, so what we're going to go through is um, some general information about, um, very quickly, what our cases are looking like at the moment. Just a quick reminder of the roadmap and the restrictions that are currently in place and what the plans are going forward. And then I'll spend a bit more time just saying what our key messages are around testing. And then I'll hand over to Anna, who will um, talk a bit about the vaccination uh, rollout and a um, little bit about signposting and support. And we're thinking you as um, key volunteers in the community coming across lots of different people in your day-to-day um, -day volunteering will hopefully help us to um, communicate some of these um, key public health messages. So thank you. So um, I'm sure most of you are aware, but um, in terms of our COVID-19 picture in uh, Baines, we have always um, been uh, comparatively low rates of COVID-19 compared to other areas. And the Southwest has been luckily um, low levels of COVID-19 compared to the national average. So um, in terms of our, you might see it presented on the news or whatever as um, cases per 100,000. So at the moment, our cases per 100,000 population are is 10.9. So that's 10.9 cases per 100,000 population. So that's about 22 cases in the last week. Um, somewhere, and we've been bubbling along in that um, rate of around sort of between 20 and 30 cases for the last few weeks, um, which, as I say, is um, comparable with the Southwest rate. The England rate is um, about double that at the moment, it's 22.5. And in the Southwest, generally, we tend to be at the low end. And places like Swindon and Bristol tend to have slightly higher rates. So there's this sort of 19 or 18 respectively per 100,000. So it, did, it has varied over the course of this pandemic in terms of the, the predominant age range affected by the cases. Um, and at the moment it is definitely in the younger age group. Um, on this slide, it says 25 to 39, but you know, next week, that could change and actually previously it was it was more in the 0 to 17 age range so schools are open so we're seeing some cases there as well as amongst this 25 to 39 age range. Luckily um, we haven't had any deaths in the past month which is really good news and, and very few cases in schools and currently no active cases in care homes and um, very, very small numbers of people in the RUH with COVID-19, which is a really good place to be. I mean, over the course of the pandemic, 
we've had 8,300 cases in, in Baines, which is, is a significant number. And unfortunately we have had 293 deaths, um, sadly in, in relation to COVID-19. So we have been affected quite significantly for some people, but not as, not as, uh, as much as other parts of the country, as I'm sure you're aware. Sorry, Anna, on to the next one now. So you'll be, I'm sure, more than aware of, of our current restrictions. So the main change over the last week or so has been that socialising inside has been allowed. So the rule of six or two households meeting indoors. Um, and of course, indoor entertainment, bars and restaurants opened, indoor sport, etc. So we will see a rise in cases as a result of more people having more contact. Um, so we, we are expecting to see a slight rise. Um, looking ahead, yeah, no sooner than the 21st, uh, June 21st, we would, we, would, we would be expecting for all legal limits on social contact to be removed. But you can hear at the moment there's some um, uh, caution shall we say about that and of course the situation being reviewed on a regular basis dependent on what's happening with uh, variants and mutations so you will have heard a lot about um, variants of concern um, B1617.2 which is the variant that ha had originated from India and how more transmissible that is and so seeing cases rise so it's being reviewed on a regular basis but this is the this is the plan isn't it to remove all all legal limits reopen everything and um get back to normal is what we probably all hope for but again that's with some caution so um in relation to testing i'm sure um many of you are familiar with with what tests are available um, but what we are finding is um, amongst the general public is that people are a bit confused about which test to take when. Um, so we just thought we'd just quickly run through it. So at the moment, the technology we have available to us for the general public is uh, PCR tests for people with symptoms and rapid lateral flow tests. And some of you may have been doing those if you've been um, going to the vaccination centre for example. So PCR tests are the ones that need to be sent to the lab and, the, and you get the results within uh, one to two days but rapid lateral flow tests are the ones you can uh, get the results within 30 minutes. So just this slide is just about the PCR tests. So predominantly for people with symptoms. So anyone with symptoms, including children with symptoms, need to get a PCR test. No, guys, no. <laughs> um, so what that, that basically stands for polymerase chain reaction, and it detects genetic material from the virus. So that's RNA. And um, you can locally, you can walk in or drive through test sites or you can get these kits sent to your home. So our local test sites are there. So Carpenter House um, down by the bus station in Bath, you can walk in there, Odd Down Park and Ride and Poulton Rovers Football Club. So you, you need to book for these test sites and you go onto the link there or you can call 119. So if you haven't got symptoms, um, and we know that one in three people um, with coronavirus don't have symptoms and so it can be spread without knowing it. Um, everyone is now being encouraged to uh, do regular rapid lateral flow tests and they're looking for something different. They are antigen tests and they're detecting specific proteins from the virus um, and they're particularly good at picking up people who are infectious at that point, you know, highly infectious at that point when they take the test. Um, so they give you a very quick result. You basically do the same swab as a PCR, put the swab into a solution, drop the solution onto a cartridge, and it'll give you that result in under 30 minutes. Um, and so it helps us with controlling the spread because people can immediately self-isolate um, and then get a confirmatory PCR. So if, if it, the, the uh, concern we have about lateral flow would be if you get a negative test result, that doesn't mean 
you can um, not follow the guidance. We still need you to follow the guidance because um, at any point you could be incubating the virus and a lateral flow test will only pick up people with a high viral load. So when you're really infectious. So the best way of making this test as effective as possible is to do it twice a week, three to four days apart. And so that's got more chance then of picking up a positive. So uh, at the moment, we've got three sites in Bath where you can get an assisted test. I mean, you do it yourself, but there's people there who will help you if you need help. And uh, you can also pick up free test kits at these sites as well. So there's a, a new site in the centre of town next to the body shop. That's three Burton Street. And we've just moved our Canesham and Midsummer Norton sites. So they were um, Cainsham in the Masonic Hall, and now that's moved into the centre of town, into that Ashton Way car park where, where most people park if they're going into Cainsham. And the South Road car park in Midsummer Norton, we've got um, a porter cab in there. And, and, and at both of those as well, you can get a test as well as pick up your home self-test kits uh, that you can take away and do at home. And so every local pharmacy in Bath, sorry, just go back, every, every local pharmacy in Bath will also give you um, free lateral flow test kits. So if people are asking where they can get them from, they should be able to get them, um, you know, in the local high street. And if they can't do that, you can also order them online and get them sent to, to home. And you'll be aware, um, certainly if you've got children in secondary school and some workplaces are also providing testing and kits for staff. OK, so I've talked about PCRs for people with symptoms, but um, recently the policy changed uh, so that if you've been a close contact of someone who's tested positive for COVID-19, you can get a PCR test now, whether, whether or not you have symptoms. Um, so it used to be you only got it if you had symptoms, but now if you're a close contact, you're also being encouraged to get a PCR test. And that's because... Um, it would quickly tell you if you were uh, a positive. You must still self-isolate uh, if you're a close contact and that PCR comes back negative. So if you, if you test positive using a rapid lateral flow test, you will be asked to get a confirmatory PCR test to make sure that you are actually positive. Um, so you, you need to do that really within two days of having the lateral flow test. If you're going into hospital, um, you, you may be asked to get uh, a lateral flow, um, a PCR test or a lateral flow test, and, but the hospital will arrange that for you. You won't need to go to these community sites. And if you're traveling abroad, you, sh you shouldn't be using the NHS testing sites or process. You need to pay for your tests privately and you can go online and there's lots of recommended, government recommended uh, private test providers. OK. Go on to the next one. OK, so Anna will talk now about um, vaccination. Thanks, Cathy. So, um, yeah, Anna Brett again, and I work with Cathy in the, in the council's public health team. And I'm just going to spend the next sort of five or ten minutes talking to you about the vaccination programme. Um, so my first slide shows you the percentage uptake of first and second doses amongst all of the different cohorts who are eligible for vaccination. And these figures are for um, Bath and North East Somerset as well as Swindon and Wiltshire. But Bain's figures alone are very similar. So hopefully this gives you a really good idea. And it shows you actually that uptake is really good, <laughs> um, particularly in the um, older age groups. When we first started vaccinating back in December, you can see uptake for first doses are well up high into the 90 percent. They're obviously slightly lower as we go into what we call cohort 10, 11 and 12. And they're your younger age groups, the under um, 50 year olds. And obviously they've been offered the vaccine much later on in the programme, which is why the uptake's lower. Um, but we are making really good progress. And the good news is, is that second doses are also looking very good. Um, so in the much older age groups, again, the second dose uptake is, is almost as high as the first. You know, lots and lots of people have had both doses of the vaccine, which is brilliant. 
And then as we go down the different age groups, obviously the percentage uptake in the second doses does decrease. Um, but, you know, we're still on track to offer all 18 year olds the first dose of the vaccine by the end of July this year. Um, so that should give you an idea of where we are at the moment. Sorry, I'm just trying to go on to the next slide. OK, so next slide. Who can get the vaccine? So I'm sure you're aware that you, you have to be in one of the eligible groups to be able to get your vaccine. And currently, everyone that's over 30 is eligible. And um, this age almost decreases sometimes by the day. <laughs> so the only way of knowing which age group are currently eligible is really going onto the NHS website and having a look. Like I said, I anticipate the 29 year olds being eligible very soon. Um, obviously, the other um, eligible groups are those that are um, clinically extremely vulnerable, um, those who are carers, people who live or work in care homes, and also health and social care staff. I often get asked, what's the best way to book your vaccine? And the good news is it should be a lot easier now. Um, the National Booking Service is via the NHS website, and you go on and you put in your details. Um, or you can call NHS 119 for those that don't have access to the internet. Um, that is now the most efficient and probably best way to book your vaccination. Um, if you were in cohorts one to nine, which are your over 50 year olds and the carers, health and social care workers, etc., you may have been invited for your first dose by your GP practice. Um, if that was the case, you will be contacted by the same a method for your second dose, but generally now all new eligible groups go via the National Booking Service or call 119. Um, and the NHS are bringing forward some of those second dose appointments. So you would have heard, I mean, generally it was always 11 to 12 weeks that you would get your second dose. And now for the over 50s in particular, second doses are being brought forward to more like eight weeks. And the link to the National Booking Service is on the bottom of the page. So when you book your appointment, you do obviously need to book two doses and have two separate appointments for each dose. And if you go um, on the National Booking Service or you phone 119, they do ask you to book both appointments at the same time. So that's to guarantee you're going to get both doses. And like I said, at the moment, it's between eight and 12 weeks between first and second doses. If you've already had COVID-19, so you've taken one of the PCR tests that Kathy mentioned, you should wait at least four weeks from the date that you had the test before you book your appointment. And I'll go through that a bit more um, in one of my latest slides. Um, when you book your appointment, you would have picked up probably that if you're um, under the age of 40, for instance, um, it's not recommended that you have AstraZeneca vaccine, or if you're pregnant, it's also recommended that you don't have AstraZeneca vaccine, that you have the Pfizer or Moderna vaccine instead. And the good news now is, is that the national booking system is sophisticated enough to pick up that and then make sure that you do get offered an appointment of the vaccine that you require. So where can I get the COVID-19 vaccine? Well, um, you will put, generally put in your postcode to the national booking system or give that to the 119 operator. And at the time, of doing so, you will get offered an appointment specific for you and your needs at the closest centre offering that vaccine to you. So if you live in Bath and North East Somerset, the most likely venue that you'll get offered is Bath Racecourse. But appointments do change sometimes by the hour, okay, and that won't always be the case. You may then get offered the next available closest vaccination centre to you and that may indeed now be a pharmacy that's offering the COVID vaccine. Um, there are a number of pharmacies now um, in Bath and North East Somerset and surrounding areas that um, are coming online to be able to offer the COVID vaccine so there will be more of a choice of venues. Um, we do still have some of the GP sites running and I'm sure some of you have um, volunteered at places like the Pavilion or the Soma Centre they're still going, like I said, but only for second dose vaccines for cohorts one to nine. Everyone else 
will be directed to one of these larger vaccination sites or pharmacies. So if you can't find an appointment in a local centre to you, really just need to keep persevering and, and be as patient as possible. And I know that that can be highly frustrating. There has been um, supply um, sort of not problems, but not enough supply to meet demand over the recent month. The good news is though that's really improved um, over the past week and it should improve as the weeks go forward. So like I said, please do, do persevere. If you get offered an appointment miles away from anywhere, <laughs> um, you know, just go back online or phone 119 again, um, even the same day next day, and you're likely then to find new appointments that come up. So I'm now just going to run over some things about the vaccine, some frequently asked questions really that I get off um, quite asked, sorry, that I get asked quite often. Um, so why should I have the vaccine? Well, it does reduce the chance of developing severe disease. And there's really, really good evidence now that having um, one dose and definitely two doses of the vaccine really does prevent serious disease up to by about 80% and it does now reduce the risk of actually catching the infection and then onward transmission. Um, so we're learning more and more about the vaccine as time goes on and the evidence of the effectiveness of the vaccine is very good. Obviously then this reduces the pressure on the NHS it reduces the likelihood of passing on the infection to others, particularly vulnerable people that you may care for or your family and your friends. But, and there is a big but, the vaccine, you know, is only one part of our armour against COVID and it isn't necessarily 100% effective. And therefore, we do need to still be really aware that we could still develop COVID-19 we could be asymptomatic. In other words, one in three people that get COVID don't necessarily show symptoms. And we may there still for be able to pass it on. So even if you've been vaccinated with one or two doses, the guidance at the moment strongly recommends that you do still socially distance, you still wear a face mask where needed, and you do still practice really good hand hygiene at all times. If you've been vaccinated, do you still need to take a test? So as I've said, the vaccine does not provide, um, you know, it's not necessarily 100% effective. And actually it doesn't provide instant immunity. So once you've had your vaccination, immunity starts to build around three weeks after the first dose. So your body just takes quite a while sometimes to actually build that immune response. Um, and we have seen as Cathy mentioned, the virus can mutate. There is good evidence that at the moment, the vaccine does actually work against many of the mutations that we've seen in the UK, which is also good news. But you do still need to follow the testing regimes that Cathy explained, whether that's um, if you develop symptoms or even if you're asymptomatic, we still do recommend that you take those rapid flow tests every um, three to four days. So if you've had COVID-19, do I still need a vaccine? So if you've had COVID-19, then your body may have built up some natural immunity to the virus. However, it's, absolutely, it's really impossible to know how much immunity lasts, and it's really likely to vary amongst different individuals. And it is possible to catch COVID-19 again. So therefore, um, it is recommended that even if you've had COVID, you wait at least four weeks after the date of your test and that you do get, get the vaccine. So that was what I wanted to cover in terms of vaccination. We can ask, um, you can ask any questions afterwards. Um, the last slide is just where you can find out more information. So there's lots of information um, on the NHS website about the vaccination. So please do go on there and have a look. Like I said, the eligibility changes all the time and you can keep updated. Um, Bath and North East Somerset, Swindon and Wiltshire Clinical Commissioning Group also have a really good website with many commonly asked questions. So do visit there and have a look if I've not covered anything specific that you may want to know. And then lastly, we just wanted to finish by signposting you to some further support that's available. 
The public health team in Bath and North East Somerset Council have a dedicated email address, um, public underscore health at bathness.gov.uk. You can email us um, and ask any related public health COVID-19 question. Um, and we've got somebody, like I said, dedicated to answering those emails. And it, it's proved really popular, actually. So please do use it. Um, for inquiries specifically about COVID testing, we have a um, dedicated um, email address for that as well. And that's rapid underscore test at bathness.gov.uk. Um, and then for practical advice and support during the pandemic, we have the fantastic community wellbeing hub that was established near the beginning of the pandemic. And that's on the A300 number there shown, or you can e email them as well at, at the email address on the slide. Um, and I'm sure many of you have accessed that service, or if you volunteer with vulnerable people, maybe that you support, you know, that would have also accessed that service. So it is still there. Um, uh, please, you know, please do use it as much as needed. Thank you. So we're on to any questions. Um, thank you for, for that, Anna and, and Kathy and Louise for, for doing that in the background. Um, I was going to keep the questions right to the end because we do pick up a bit of that um, to do with the vaccine centres and because some of these people, these lovely people on here have been volunteering at vaccine centres and they probably know about, more about vaccine centres than anybody else, but other people, um, you know, haven't. So we'll deal with those a little bit later on when we do a little bit update at the pavilion and the um, and the race course. Um, so thank you so much. That was so informative. But um, we're just going to move on to the next bit of it then, and we'll mop up these questions at the end. Thank you, though. That was that was so informative. There was a lot to it. So thank you. Um, so we're now going to deal with the, the second part of the of the sort of course, and this is about kind of the next steps in terms of um, 3SG and the emergency response from from 3SG's point of view. So um, firstly, we want to start, um, if we go on to the next slide, Miles, um, by thanking you all for, um, for being amazing. I mean, literally, we couldn't have done this without you, first of all. Um, the amount of work and effort that you've all put in is just outstanding. You know, every day, somebody there shopping for hundreds of people. And these are the stats that um, essentially you've done, you, you guys have done over £100,000 worth of shopping for the vulnerable people through the compassionate community hub that you referred to earlier, Anna. So all the calls that, that go to the hub um, have come to um, all our volunteers who have gone out and supported people. Um, there's been over 6,000 wellbeing packs distributed, which lots of you have been involved in. You can see how many calls we've taken, two and two, over 2,000 calls um, for people requesting food, medication, befriending um, and other tasks. And we've, as a result of that, we've been able to refer 217 vulnerable people to services that they need, where they needed help. Um, at the race course, people have, com have completed over two and a half thousand shifts, which is pretty outstanding. I mean, you just are resilient. And we've only just taken on helping at the pavilion and you've already completed 120 shifts there in just over a week. So uh, well done, amazing work. Thank you very much. So. Um, so yeah, so this is a, a few more bits of what you've been up to. You helped deliver over 200 dementia packs to people living with dementia. Um, lots of you helped deliver the special star awards that we did at Christmas and the huge compassionate Christmas campaign, which fed over 200 people that were having Christmas on their own. And um, there was the Christmas Day calls and the Christmas cards. It just, it's just endless. Um, you know, many of you did help with the flyer drop where we dropped flyers to 86,000 households in Baines. Um, there was a VE Day uh, celebrations where um, many of you um, delivered sort of uh, scones and cream teas to people. Um, yeah, and then obviously there is the, the all the, the work at the vaccination centers and the people that have done all the shopping. So. All in all, I think you guys have done an absolutely amazing job, but we now have to move on from that. So that's kind of, you know, where we're at. But before we do that, um, we're going to do a little breakout session because we've been talking for a while. So we want to get you interactive on this. I'm going to hand over to Miles. Doing lots of volunteering. And this next bit is to uh, yeah, do with the people that have been working really hard to support people in their community. So the question is, what's next? What do we do next? Um, and so do you want to go to the next slide? Miles. Yeah. Okay. Can I ask you to put yourself back on mute now if you haven't already done so? 
thanks. Um, okay, so um, so basically key dates. So from the 1st of June, um, there will be no more referrals to volunteers through the hub. Um, this was an emergency volunteer response that we popped up to try and help during the COVID pandemic. And it's really, really important that we try and phase some of that, um, that you know, sort of dependency on us out essentially. So the hub will still be there. The community wellbeing hub will still be there. So people can still ring that if they need help or support, um, but we won't be taking any new uh, referrals for the service. And by the 30th of June, there'll be no more shopping or collecting medication for individuals. Now, you might be thinking, oh my gosh, what happens to the individuals? Well, we've spent a huge amount of time going through each and every person that we've been supporting to make sure that they get the right help and support, okay? So no one's gonna be left in the lurch or without anybody because we are making um, you know, real steps to make sure that everyone gets the help and support they need, not from a volunteer, but some, some professional service going forward. And you might think, uh, going on to the next slide, Miles, um, you know, why, why can't I just continue with what I'm doing? You know, I'm shopping for someone every week. Why, why can't I just do that? You know, I, I'm enjoying it. I, I like doing, I, I like the connection I have with the person that I'm supporting. Um, and why can't I continue to do it? Well, there's a number of reasons why we have to do this. Um, you can imagine that people have been in their homes, some of them, uh, relying on volunteers to shop for them or collect their medication for over a year and it's a long time for people so we need to make sure that if people are able to go out into their communities and shop for themselves and um, be able to do that then we need to give them that chance to be able to do that it doesn't help if we are constantly looking after the person because they're not going to be rehabilitated back into society if they haven't been out and about. So we have been carefully monitoring when they have their first and second vaccine to give them that confidence to get out and about in the community. And we started with about 180 uh, people that we were supporting each and every week last week. Don't forget, we had thousands that we'd supported, but we, we had a constant cohort of people. And now we're moving them on to getting them rehabilitated. So can they go back into, into doing their shopping themselves? If so, can I get a professional service to go out with them and help them shop so that they get back into the habit of being able to do it themselves? And that's really, really important. Or do they need help, um, further rehabilitation to be able to do that? Uh, what is it that they need to be able to do that themselves? Now, some people might not be able to do that themselves and they might never be able to do that themselves because the last year has taken its toll on lots of people. So the next slide shows that what we don't want to do is create um, a dependency. And what we found was that, um, that people that went off into other groups during this pandemic, there were lots and lots of groups that popped up and lots of people struggled. They struggled so much to carry on supporting the person for a long period of time because there was one or two people doing all the work and that was too much for them. So what we don't want is to create a dependency where one person is continuously um, looking after another because if something happens to that volunteer, then there's nobody available then to help that person. That person could either starve to death, um, not get the right medication. So it's really, really important that those people that can't go out, we make sure that there's a service to look after them, okay? And so that's what we're working really, really hard on, making sure that they matched up with a commission service because you know there are services that are paid to do this we only helped with it because there were so many that needed help at the start of this you know but now as we move through we should be able to match them up with a service that can provide what they need going forward now that's not to say if we go on to the next slide miles that you know if you've made a friendship with the people when you've been doing this so you can't give them the, you know there's nothing stopping you giving them the occasional call and seeing how they're doing but we don't want you to, to pick up shopping for them or medication. It's really, really important that they've got um, some sort of a structure and someone taking responsibility for that person, not yourselves. Because, you know, the last thing we want is for you to feel overburdened by this or, um, or for things to happen and that person be left in the lurch. So there's nothing wrong with giving them a call every now and then and keeping that friendship going, but, but not the shopping and the, um, and the medication collections. So um, if you are shopping for someone or doing medication collections and you haven't been recording it for whatever reason, because um, you know all our feedbacks come through our link and we pay you for this, the shopping and all the rest of it, then get in touch with me and we can talk about who you're supporting and what help that we can give them to make sure that they get that, that, that uh, professional support. Um, and that's the email address that you can use there. 
so moving on so um so that's where we are with the shopping and the medication in terms of the, the pavilion and um anna touched on, on this earlier so the pavilion um as you probably all know is run by the gp surgery so bems and um we picked up recently helping out at the uh, out of the pavilion because they were lacking volunteers um but they um I will only be running until the end of june so there's not a long time that they'll be running for now um, and they are not running for the first week of June. So some of you might have said to me, why can't I book a shift? Um, you know, it's because the shifts haven't been released yet because the whole of the, th the first week of June, they're not operating. And the second week, um, I have just had some information on that and it's probably one or two days that they will be operating. So they're phasing out the, um, the amount, of, um, amount of days that they will be doing, but it will be running until the end of June. Um, that said, if you are a volunteer there and you think, oh, well, I did all that process to sign up, there may be an opportunity to, to link up then thereafter, potentially with the, um, with the race course. So it's, it's, not, it's not a case of, oh, well, I've done all that, that work and now I haven't got anything to do, because there, there may be opportunities to be inducted at the race course as well. So we'll, we'll look at that um, when the opportunities come up. But for the moment, we do need your support on the pavilion. Every day we get cancellations, so please do log on and look at the calendar to see whether there's any availability. And thank you for everyone that picks up things last minute when I text out, I really appreciate it. So move on to the update with the race course. Um, so, you know, huge amount of work. And as, as people talked about, and Martin talked about, you know, um, some of you might have missed that, but they have definitely upped the ante in terms of how many people are coming through there. And now um, 1,600 people um, we're going through in two different um, vaccination programs with AstraZeneca and Pfizer working at the same time. Um, very complicated, but you've been doing an amazing job and great feedback of what you're doing. The idea is, is the race course at the moment, the best indication is that it'll run until the end of September. Um, but things move on a day to day basis. And as soon as I know things, we communicate them to you the same day. So, um, so, you know, we will keep you up to date if anything changes with that or um, anything happens with that. But that's that's the update on the race course. Um, so on to the next slide, please, Miles. Um, so what can I do next? So you might be thinking, OK, so I've been doing lots of volunteering, um, you know, but now what, what do I do? You know, if that's going to stop, what else could I do? And I think someone mentioned earlier about other opportunities. So obviously the newsletter will come out and that will have in it lots and lots of opportunities for you to get involved in lots of different ways. And we'll continue to send that out um, and support your community. So that'll carry on. Um, and we will also um, be sending out a questionnaire about you know, your experience and, and what you anything else you might like to get involved in. And um, also the other thing that we will be sending out information about is whether or not you want to be part of um, this emergency response going forward. So what if there was another uh, pandemic that broke out? Uh, what if, for example, um, there was another a national emergency? Would you still want to help in the same way? And so we're going to send that out because the idea is hopefully that we can keep a bank of this emergency response. So we could just pop it straight up should something like this happen in the future. Um, but entirely up to you whether you want to be a part of that. And we will send you out some more information. Um, and then on to the next slide, Miles. Um, and then we're doing this as well, which should be quite exciting. So finally, we can go out and, and meet. And it'd be lovely to see all your faces because I'm fed up with seeing people on screen. Um, but we're going to be part of the Bath Carnival this year, um, which is going to be at the Recreation Ground. It's a free event and people can come. There'll be lots of things going on, but we're going to have a 3SG Compassion Compassionate Community Village. And there we will have lots of charities and showing what, what, what charities do and how you can get involved further in your community. Hopefully have a bit of a bit of a party there. Um, you know, we can have a few beers that Martin talked about earlier. Um, and yeah, hopefully you have a really, really good time, but, but get out and see, you know, what else is out there that you can do to support your community because you've all been amazing at doing it. Um, but, you know, we want you to, um, you know, to, to carry on doing that, supporting your community in some way. So we're going to put that event on and um, hopefully uh, run that bit of things. Um, anything you want to add to that, Miles? No, I think that that was perfect, really. And yeah, just to sort of um, continue from what you said, Sarah, is we're definitely not like uh, leaving you or anything like that. We'll, we'll be keeping in touch. And once the service sort of develops, we'll probably reduce that newsletter um, 
down to sort of probably more monthly rather than bi-weekly um, and also put loads more opportunities in the newsletter as to what's going on more locally as it's as we're sort of focused more on the overall community rather than just the sort of volunteering from our side so um, and if anybody wants to sort of get involved and help with the newsletter or any any other things and do get in touch with us because um, we're always looking for people to sort of help out or if you've got any suggestions then yeah feel free to get in touch um, but now should we we, we had some questions from earlier on then, Sarah. So yes. shall I shall I bring them up? Um, okay. Start going through some of so, the questions. Yeah, no, no problem. So um, I'll just go from the ones right at the start that we had in the chat. And then if you do have any more questions, feel free to pop them in the chat now and we'll sort of go over them. So the first ones are going to be for Anna and the team. Um, so the, the first one was, has the pavilion in bath now sees to offer the vaccine so we've just covered that one um so i think that one's all okay um that it definitely will be until the end of june um but then the the second question was will there be any pharmacies in kingsham offering vaccines um you able to answer that one anna thanks yeah sure so we are hoping that there will be a good coverage of um, pharmacies across Bath and North East Somerset and it is looking very likely that there will be one in Kingsham. Um, so it's not been made 100% official yet. I think I am anticipating um, that we'll know um, all the pharmacies within the next week or two um, but I'm fairly confident that there will be one in Kingsham. Great, thank you. I think um, the next one was any indications of how long the race school centre will be open and hence how long you need volunteers. I think I dealt with that. It's probably going to be towards the end of September is when they need them for. So hopefully we will need volunteers the whole time. Um, but I should explain that obviously there are national services. That's why St. John's were brought in, for example, because um, there are national contracts that have been in the background of this. So um, we never know whether that's going to change or anything. But, you know, um, as far as I'm aware, that's that's the situation. Um, Miles, are you back now? <laughs> it keeps dropping off, oh, so I'm just literally not sure if he's there. <laughs> um, okay, I think he's gone again. So we'll say um, there's a next next question is um, there's talk that will be a need to be a yearly booster. Is there any news on that, Anna? Do you want to do all this one? <laughs> So again, if only I could tell you something official. Um, so there is no official, um, you know, guidance on a booster, um, but it does look again very likely that we will have one. At the moment, they're suggesting that it will be for the over 50s. Um, but again, you know, things change so rapidly, don't they? A until we get that official announcement from the government, for any sort of booster vaccination, um, then it's difficult to say, you know, 100%. I think what is being looked at is, um, you know, if there is a booster vaccination, how does that coincide with, say, the flu vaccination and how can they be delivered? You know, because obviously there will need to be plans that um, already, I think, starting to be thought about, about how that would actually work in practice. You know, and that could be as early as the autumn as we move into the next sort of winter winter season. So, yeah, sorry, I can't say for sure, um, but it looks like there is a booster vaccine on the way and it, and it may look very similar to, to what we have for flu vaccination at the moment. Thank you, Anna. Um, so I think um, this one's probably for Cathy Moore. What will happen for people who suddenly need to self-isolate for the first time in future due to a positive COVID test? they need support oh sorry with support or shopping or medication um so i can probably answer that one um they will be able to ring through to the compassionate to the community well-being hub keep calling it the compassionate community hub and um, if they do need support there will be um other support that's potentially available to them okay so um so they can still use that number to ring through if they need help um okay so next one um can I ask if the clients are being offered impartial advice in services or just from the organisations based at the hub when the volunteers step back? OK, so what happens is this. Um, every week I attend um, meetings where um, a, a huge number of charities um, come um, to the meeting and we look at what services people can be transferred to. So those services will say that's something I could pick up. Um, and we have looked at across the board, across Baines, any commission services, that is any services that are being paid for 
um, by the local authority. Um, and so we would look at any of those sort of services that people can go over to and whether they have capacity. And then the, the people have a choice as to which service they go over to. So that's how we work um, based on capacity, um, ability and the, um, you know, the sort of fine detail of whether that service is going to be useful for them. OK, and there's no point in offering them a load of abundance of services that are not tailored to what they need. So, you know, we work with social prescribers, Virgin Care, the council, um, as well as all the big charities to work out what the best thing is for that person. And then we give them the option as to whether they want to go to that service or not. And that's kind of what we've we've kind of done across the board. Does that answer your question? Um, who answered that question? Uh, Tanya. Does that answer your question? Where is she? You can unmute yourself if you like. Uh, maybe she's not on here. Okay. Um, and then Maggie Holness has said, has, any, has anywhere started to give the Moderna vaccine in veins? That's uh, over to you, Anna. <laughs> yeah, so we don't have any Moderna vaccine in veins as of yet. Um, the supply chain of the vaccine changes all the time. Um, there is obviously Moderna in the country and as far as I know in the southwest. Um, so it is possible that we could see Moderna in veins. Um, but again, I don't know when that would be. Supplies literally change sort of week by week. Um, so watch this space really for Moderna. <laughs> We really don't want it at the, at the race course for anybody that's already dealing with two vaccinations. It's like traffic lights, do you know what I mean? The third one is just, oh man, too much. Um, I don't, there's no other questions on there. Does anyone else have a question they want to, to raise? If you do, you can just take yourself off mute now um, and raise it if you like. Um, if not, then I just want to say thank you so much to um, Anna and, and Kathy and Louise, who was doing the, the work in the background as well. Thank you, Louise. Um, and yeah, thank you all for coming and listening and thank you for all that you've done. Anyone want to ask Definitely. anything? And if, and if you do want to ask anything at the end, then do stick around. We'll be here. Um, um, sort of, we can can't I, buy a beer for you, but <laughs> just yeah. Can I ask we'll something? Be around to chat. Oh, yes, you can. Who's that? Judy. Oh, hi, Judy. Hi. Um, one of our group wanted to know if she could take her own high vis to the race course because there's no cleaner up there at the moment. Can she take her own high vis that she washes herself? So we, we ask you not to do that because of the branding. I think a lot of the high vis has had different branding on them. Has it got a branding with the no. eye stuff on it? No, it's no, it's got nothing on it. It's just a plain a yellow high vis. Then that's probably fine. Is the answer? Uh, we ask you not to do, to use the RVS ones because it just confuses people that you're from a different organisation and, and and things like that. So if it's a plain one, I don't think it'd be a problem, Judy. Okay, I'll tell her. Good. Thank you. Excellent. Any other questions? Have the people who we shop for been told about the shopping deadline? Yeah. So every single person that we have down as a what we call a continued support client um we have contacted via our team um some of our team was on you earlier and they've been frantically making calls to people to make sure they understand the position and then what we're doing is trying to get them over to a service where we've got time to make sure that service works for them so you know a lot of these people have been transferred to a service and we've gone behind them saying have, have they had the shop you know has everything worked out before we actually take away the volunteer so please be sure that we are doing dealing with it very very carefully that nobody will be left without a service that can help them um even even so far as applying for benefits for them to make sure that if they don't qualify for a service we can get benefits that would negate the cost of any service so yeah there's there's a lot of work being done to make sure no one's left in the lurch um yeah, you're very welcome. Sarah's working very late, <laughs> essentially, to make sure that everyone's cared for, along with the core team. So I can testify for that. 